it's an honor to be here. And um, I just want to thank Barry and Jonathan for their cordiality, their inviting me. And I'm very moved by the worship service here. I was telling the girls as they were gearing up, and we were out in the hallway, and there was something about the timbre of their voices that started to cheer me up. And um, that's before they were even singing. So for some reason, that had a very strong uh, emotional impact. So let me uh, get my voice back. <clears throat> so, praise the Lord. Um, what I want to talk about today is, as I would say to my ascetic students, uh, and you're all students, so let's talk as, as though we were together in a class. A work of art speaks on three primary levels. The formal level, the thing that we see, the thematic level, the narrative or the story that it tells, and the context, the contextual circumstances out of which a work of art comes, very similar to what's done in biblical exegesis when we're studying theology. It's very much the same process. There's an amazing way in which Van Gogh's pictures uh, contribute to the Christian dialogue in ways that are very surprising. It's one of the reasons why I entitled my book The Untold Journey, because as I started doing my research on Van Gogh's 902 letters so many years ago, I was struck by the fact that I seemed to be tracking a very familiar story, and I realized that it was actually uh, the, the return of the prodigal son. I also recognized that it was a story that I recognized from the Old Testament, the story of Samson. These are people who were very gifted in many ways. Uh, the, the prodigal son was gifted with wealth and prosperity, and Samson was given great strength and other things, but both of these gentlemen um, drifted away. They had times of, of doubt and uncertainty. And I began to realize that although my work on Van Gogh's Untold Journey began really as a dissertation at Claremont Graduate University, it ended up being something very different than I thought it would be, and even what my doctoral mentors uh, probably guess it would be. I thought it would largely be an examination of the ideas that were current in the 19th century. I looked at people like Schleiermacher and Hegel and a lot of philosophical treatises and other things and began to realize that these weren't the main point, although these things gave me some insight into uh, the context of the 19th century. What really was driving me was the, a story that meant a lot to me. And it was a story of reconciliation and redemption, the very thing that the, the girls, the, the worship team, were singing about today. I was amazed at, at the, uh, the number of lyric that I heard this morning that seemed to be a part of the Van Gogh story. So it's a universal story, and it's one that probably has more application than many of us realize, and perhaps many of, of, of the uh, apocryphal stories and other things that we've heard about Van Gogh. He's a controversial character which for me makes the story all the more interesting, uh, because for many people, Jesus is a controversial person too, and not everyone agrees uh, about his identity. And um, what's interesting about Van Gogh is that, as my, one of my mentors uh, at Claremont, who was a Christian, by the way, John um, K. Roth, he said to me, he said, you know, the story of Van Gogh is, is not unlike the story of Jesus. He's someone who comes into the world and is a stumbling block for many people who is gravely misunderstood and misquoted. One of the things that I want to say to you straight off is that Van Gogh, at the end of his uh, journey, uh, was talking about Jesus Christ. He was the son of, of, of a pastor. He was also the grandson of a pastor and also the nephew of a pastor. He came from a background of professional clergymen. And uh, he was someone who wanted to be a clergyman. His early letters are just full of yearning to be like his father and to be a Van Gogh, uh, uh, which for him meant a part of a, a very special group of almost elite clergymen and theologians. He also had relatives who were highly ranked in the Dutch Navy. His uncle was the vice admiral of the Dutch Navy. And his, on his mother's side, uh, there were, they were credited as the binders of the Constitution of Holland. So people don't realize that Van Gogh came from an extremely prestigious family with uh, centuries, really, of high-ranking, uh, very important people who figured into the history of Dutch Republic. 
And here was Vincent, who, like a prodigal son, um, decides to to leave it in a way. He he he's uh, troubled by hypocrisy. He uh, attempts to be a lay evangelist in the Bornage region of Belgium, and uh, is there uh, ministering to minors, and ends up being fired by a synod of uh, clergymen, and it left him very. Uh, Disoriented, he came. He comes home, and his father, who was a very dear man, um, but not an advocate for his own son, doesn't defend his own son in the face of a whole community. And um, it's very difficult for him. So, amid all of this, Van Gogh begins to talk about the power of, believe it or not, the resurrection. He said, "I'm not sure about a lot of things right now, especially after being fired and I'm seeing the hypocrisy of the church. I wonder where Jesus is alive in all of this." So he says, "The power for him is in the resurrection of Christ." He said, "I believe in the absolute promise of Jesus that we will be one day raised to eternal life and have redeemed physical bodies." Of all of the uh, Christians I've ever known, and I feel like I do know him, the resurrection meant so much to him. And he began to use the resurrection as a way of understanding his own art. He said, you know, uh, when I create works of art, I take materials that are essentially dead. I take clay, I take uh, paint, and I use this material to invest it with my imagination and my spirit. He said, in a sense, it is a resurrection. I've taken something that is essentially not worth very much, and I've given it expressive power. And I feel that I understand something about the nature of God and His desire to take things that are uh, like us, um, mortal, short-lived, and give them a type of immortality. And amid all of this, he, after losing his job as a clergyman and so on, he begins to draw. He wasn't very good at the beginning. He's taken up by a Protestant uh, pastor who's living actually in the Bornage region and begins giving Vincent some drawing lessons. And Van Gogh feels as though he's getting on solid ground. He said, I feel like I'm regaining my balance. I feel as though uh, I'm finding a purpose. I'm probably not going to be a clergyman. And this is very disappointing to me. But perhaps I can use all of the zeal that I had uh, for religion and fold it into my artistic production. And ladies and gentlemen, Van Gogh is someone who should mean something to all of us because he is probably one of the most eloquent Christian spokesmen of, of the arts for many, many reasons, um, not including his own need for redemption and resurrection. Amid all of this, Van Gogh, who is a voluminous reader, Many historians claim he was probably the best read artist in the history of art, which is going to be surprising to a lot of people. He had extremely high IQ, great ability to memorize and remember. And um, many of you probably wonder, well, what about his illness and so on and so forth. And the point was that, um, am I speaking loud enough? Is the volume okay? Can people hear me in the back? Yes. My wife is in the back. She's, she's gave me the high sign. By the way, she was Clyde Cook's personal secretary, and I'm very pleased to, to say that she had a long history here at Biola. So thank you. Everyone hears me now? Okay, continue on. He begins reading the book Les Miserables. He had read it more than once in his life. And um, this is after he begins to have a, a series of epileptic seizures, very severe. And the reason that he was having these epileptic seizures, there's some controversy about it. He didn't have epilepsy in the uh, early part of his life. It only came on in the last uh, probably 18 months of his life. And um, there was a theory that he was, uh, had consumed absinthe, which was an unre unregulated alcoholic beverage. It was made illegal during the First World War. <clears throat> and Van Gogh uh, very likely consumed a lot of it. It may have affected his central nervous system and brought on epileptic seizures. Toulouse-Lautrec suffered from the same symptoms. Uh, and also lived a very short life. Van Gogh, of course, passes away at the age of, of only 37. So let's, let's move on quickly. The Starry Night, which is the, really a subject of my talk, is a work that comes out of Van Gogh's reading of Les Miserables. 
And uh, one of the important things about the work is that it talks about redemption. It is a theme of, uh, based on a, a Jean Valjean, who is a criminal, who is reformed, and um, he is someone who uh, experiences the redemption of, of a bishop who uh, cared for him enormously. People often wonder about Van Gogh and what he looked like. We have a photograph here on the, the left that was recently found in the 1990s and very likely is a, a photograph of him. It's been examined by forensic pathologists. And if you examine the, the, this work and the paintings of Van Gogh, you realize that it certainly lines up with what he looked like. Uh, it hasn't been fully documented by the Van Gogh Museum, but uh, <coughs> most people who know anything about it are pretty sure it's the original thing. Van Gogh and the Gospel, very central to him. Van Gogh said that of all of the things of the Gospel, the thing that meant the most to him was love thy neighbor as thyself and love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, thy whole mind, and thy whole spirit and love your neighbor as yourself. His early writings uh, are, are filled with references to the Gospel. Uh, he said a very beautiful thing when he was in the Bornage region. He said in Brabant, uh, where he grew up, he said, I see the hedgerows and I see all of the snow on the ground and the characters of bushes growing up are like pages out of the gospel, a direct reference to Van Gogh, meaning that in the rural communities in this, uh, in this, this simple life form, he found the humility of, of Christ and the redemption and a kind of call to the arts. His early work shows people struggling with burdens in snow, especially. We see people carrying sacks of coal, a work that was stimulated by his work in the mining communities. We see on the left people carrying uh, heavy loads of wood. He, of course, knew in, in, immediately what Jesus had said about carrying heavy burdens and his wanting to lighten the burden. Van Gogh's, uh, very interestingly, in the 18, uh, around 1888 and so on, he begins to paint portraits of his parents. His father had died in 1885. Uh, Vincent, sadly enough, was accused of, of provoking his father having a stroke because the two of them were arguing. And um, three years later, Van Gogh had an opportunity to see a peasant who looked exactly like his father in, in 1888, and Vincent hired this peasant to pose for him. And he began to do a whole series of portraits of, of this gentleman. That's Van Gogh's father on the right, died in 1885. Vincent's mother lived well on into 1907. That's a portrait that Vincent painted of her. It's in the Norton Simon Museum. These are two key people who played a great role in Van Gogh's life, and, and the Van Gogh story really is a family story in ways that'll be surprising to anybody who really studies it. And um, that the woman on the, the left was his sister-in-law, Joanna Van Gogh Bonger. She's someone you should know about. <clears throat> She dies in 1925. She inherits all of Van Gogh's letters, all of his artwork. Her husband, Theo, who is an art dealer, and Vincent's a brother, had died in 1891. And so she became the heir of all of this work and vowed that for the rest of her life that she would bring it into the world, publish his letters, and become the advocate of Van Gogh. She's an amazing woman. My publisher and I are actually working on a new book on her. It's uh, taking time, and, uh, but it's an amazing story, and I'm very moved by this story, too. It has to do with tremendous dedication and devotion to a cause. We see a photograph of Joanna. She had a little baby there. The baby was named Vincent Willem Van Gogh after, after the, the uncle. So in other words, Van Gogh's nephew is named after him, including his middle name and everything. This a little boy grows up to be an architect, and he is the man who actually designs the Van Gogh Museum that holds his uncle's work. It's an amazing inside story of a sister-in-law and then again an uncle who, like a, a real Van Gogh, uh, partake in a great uh, tr story. Van Gogh's letters look like this. There's 902 of them. He had a very beautiful handwriting. He liked to illustrate his things. If he was on Facebook, you can imagine what that would look like. And um, what is wonderful is as you study these letters, you get a, a, a drama. The untold journey came out of my study of the, these letters over many years. I began to realize that at the end of his life, he sent letters of apology to his mother. He tried to make up for all of the harm that he had caused because he was a very intense person, could be disruptive and argumentative. And um, after being fired as a clergyman, it, it rather scarred him. It took him a long time to over, overcome that. He had a tremendous love of Charles Dickens and also uh, of the writings of Victor Hugo. Van Gogh 
had all of the collected writings of both uh, of Dickens, Shakespeare, and many others. He liked to have a complete set of the books of these guys. And uh, paperback books were available then, so it was possible for an artist like Vincent, who didn't have a lot of money, to own all those books, which he would schlep around uh, as well. And so we have, uh, Van G uh, we have Dickens here. And Dickens, by the way, was a great advocate of the poor and actually donated money f to redeem uh, girls who had been involved in prostitution and so on, setting up homes for them and things like that. And Van Gogh loved that. Van Gogh had a great advocacy for the poor after being fired and after experiencing a great deal of poverty in his journey. One of the, the, the most popular illustrations of the 19th century was this painting by Samuel Luke Files, painted in 1874 by one of the illustrators of Dickens. And Van Gogh loved this picture. It had a tremendous impact during the Victorian era. And if you can't see it way in the back, these are people waiting in a halfway house to get in out of the cold and not um, freeze to death. And, um, which did occur a great deal in London during the 19th century. This painting meant a lot to Vincent, and he wanted to make pictures that were similar to it, and um, to essentially illustrate the life of the poor. One of his most popular early pictures, the one that Van Gogh thought was his greatest work, was painted in 1885, and it's called The Potato Eaters. And um, it talks about the, the humble life of these simple people, and Van Gogh is very moved uh, by this. A pair of shoes, a pair of worn shoes, in a way, these can become symbolic of uh, the life of the poor and our traveling in life. And Van Gogh's led, uh, paintings become an incarnation of that. This is why art is so important. It, is, it can glorify God. It can glorify the things that we often overlook. Van Gogh turns to overtly religious paintings at the end of his life, just months before he dies. Two months before his die, he dies, he paints The Good Samaritan and The Raising of Lazarus, both of these paintings stimulated by the work of great artists like Rembrandt and others. His letters and his comments are absolutely beautiful about Jesus. Uh, he also paints landscapes that he feels glorify God. And uh, he paints himself as a young man at 1889, uh, and he gives this to his mother on her 70th birthday. So it showed a great deal of devotion to his mother. The gentleman on the right is Patience Escalier, who was a peasant, who looked exactly like Van Gogh's father. So I put these three up, uh, all paintings of Van Gogh that tell us about his feeling of love for his family and this de desire for family unity that was so much on his mind at the end of his life after returning as a prodigal son from wandering around. Victor Hugo is the story, really the center of the, the uh, origins of Starry Night. We have Victor Hugo here, and we have uh, ref references to the painting that Vincent wants to do. And he talks in particular about a particular bishop who is uh, uh, in this painting, Starry Night. And uh, he does first a version called Starry Night on Rome, Rome uh, River, 1888. He then follows it with this iconic image a year later, 1889. Uh, he's been reading uh, the, the Le, Le Miserables, and he finds this passage in Les Miserables, which means so much to him. And I'm not going to read all of it to you, but I'll give you just an idea of what it says there, if you can't read it. He was in the presence of the great spectacle of the starry firmament, sometimes late at night, as if the women were awake. They could hear him slowly walk, promenading the walks. He was there alone with himself, collected, tranquil, adoring, comparing the serenity of his own heart with the serenity of the skies, moved in the darkness by the visible splendors of the constellation and the invisible splendor of God, opening soul to the thoughts which fall from him, and so on and so forth. It's a prayer. And Van Gogh is very moved by this, and he said, I want to paint this. And so he begins to uh, invest this picture with very brilliant um, moon that could also be a sun, as though the moon itself was becoming into the sun, as though the night was being disintegrated, and as though daylight were overtaking it. He paints stars as though they were flowers of the night. And the picture becomes a tribute also to his own religious upbringing. We see the church there. We see the stars. We see this energy that spins around the picture. He said he had a terrible need for religion at this time. And he writes this. Christ alone of all the philosophers, magi, etc., has affirmed as a principal certainty eternal life, the infinity of time, the nothingness of death, the necessity and the raison d'etre, and uh, the devotion. He lived serenely as a greater artist than all other artists, despising marble and clay as well as color. 
working in living flesh, that is to say, this matchless artist, hardly to be conceived of by the obtruse instrument of our modern, nervous, stupefied brains, made neither statues nor pictures nor books, he loudly proclaimed that he made living men immortal. This is serious, especially because it's the truth. And who would dare to tell us that he, Jesus, lied on the day that, when scornfully foretelling the collapse of the Roman edifice, he declared, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall never pass away. And so when we examine the picture and we uh, look at it in the context of the Good Samaritan and the other overtly painted religious pictures that he was painting, including the sower, we begin to recognize that like his iconic sunflowers, which are cast away and then recreated, that the... Uh, that the uh, painting ha is loaded with religious content. And we can do a, a final analysis of the picture if we want to. We can look at a lot of other things, and I'm also looking at time. Van, Van Gogh's death, I'll just offer this to you. Just a few minutes, a few uh, years ago, a document was found. It was a confession of an elderly man who claimed that he was very much involved with Van Gogh. He and some young friends had a pistol, and they may have accidentally shot Van Gogh. It's a letter of, of testimony. There was also a very strong belief, even at the uh, as late as 1920s and 30s, of uh, people living in Auvergne, where Van Gogh died, that he was accidentally <coughs> shot. There is reason to b believe that he may have been accidentally shot, although there's also reason to believe he may have taken his own life, because the circumstances surrounding it were controversial. I'll just leave it uh, that. There's a mystery surrounding his death. One of the, the great joys of producing this book on Van Gogh is that I was taken on by a publisher who donates over 50% <laughs> of any income that we make publishing books to saving the lives of, of girls particularly who have been trafficked. And uh, we, it's of advocacy, it's called the Endangered Children Foundation. And I have uh, signed copies of the book, and the book has done very well internationally, praise the Lord. We sell them on, on Amazon and, 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 book, and museums and so on. And um, I'd like to make the book available really to discount to all of the students who'd want one. And, um, my wife and I will be at the back of the room. And um, you'll find that the book is beautifully printed with really high quality reproductions of Van Gogh work. It's filled with uh, detailed analysis of these pictures and paintings and written in a way that I think is very accessible. If you're in, at all interested in seeing how important uh, art and theology really can be in the life of a Christian, I think the book you find to be a real uh, blessing. And I'm not just saying that because I had anything to do with it. I really feel that it is part of the afterlife of art and part of the work that we all have to do as um, Christians, which is to glorify God with whatever we have, with whatever gifting we have. Van Gogh is like all of us. He is someone who had a gift. He is someone who sometimes doubted his gift. And what makes him so important to all of us is he's someone who is, I think, redeemed, just like all of us. We are people who uh, are giving the, the enormous gift of Christ's sacrificial death that takes care of all of our sins. That's an amazing thing when it occurs to us that it's deity paying the price that only deity could pray, pay for our humanity. That's the ultimate redemption. And it gives purpose to art, and it gives purpose to life, and it gives purpose to existence. And that's really what Van Gogh did. He glorified existence by really painting it with enormous love and conviction and um, glorifying God. And that is something that is so wonderful, really. And it takes us to nature in a way with um, a feeling of great appreciation. As, uh, as, as uh, the saying goes, the heavens tell out the glory of God. And when you see the starry night, which I could analyze in great detail, you're going to discover it's a painting really about that theme, glorifying God and creation, and also glorifying redemption and um, all of our redemption. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything, from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.